Well, it's good to have an opportunity once again to indulge my passion of uh, church history and share with you uh, some thoughts on a, on a pretty unknown uh, man in our day, but uh, very well known in his generation, a man called Daniel B. Wilson, and uh, he was an evangelical Anglican. And I thought it'd just be good just to explain a little bit about um, Anglicanism, because a lot of people don't really fully understand what happened. But back in 1534, uh, there was a king in England called Henry VIII, and uh, he was desirous to get a divorce uh, from Catherine of Aragon so that he could marry uh, the new flame in his life, Anne Boleyn, and he couldn't get an annulment from the Catholic Church. So he declared himself in the act of supremacy to be the head of the Church of England. And so the Church of England was born in 1534. Now, that Church of England, unlike other Reformation churches in Europe, was a very mixed bag. In fact, there were two distinct groupings within the Church of England. There was the what we call the Anglo-Catholic or High Church grouping, which continues to this day. Uh, they uh, believe in the Mass. They celebrate the Mass. They uh, worship Mary. Uh, they're like Roman Catholics in every way, except they don't recognize the Pope as the head. They recognize the monarch of the British Isles as the head, but they're basically Catholic. On the other hand, there were uh, those that followed the Reformation teaching, and therefore there's always been an evangelical wing in the Anglican Church. And uh, this evangelical wing, so there was really two parties. Uh, and and then in the 1800s, a third party came into the mixture, and that was the what we call the liberal wing. And that was because of German higher criticism. Uh, that began to influence people. And so there are people in the Anglican Church today who would deny the resurrection of Christ. There are people in the Anglican Church who would be as woke as you could possibly get uh, gay bishops, all this kind of thing, everything you could imagine. And so basically, you've got three streams in Anglicanism, and the the evangelical wing has produced some tremendous uh, men of God. We've studied some of them before. Uh, we did William Grimshaw of Howarth. He was one we mentioned, but there, there were many godly men, of course. The Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, were Anglicans. We tend to think of them as Methodists, but they were primarily and lived and died as Anglicans. Uh, so was George Whitfield, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, a tremendous uh, godly Anglican man, William Wilberforce, the man responsible for uh, seeking to overflow, overthrow slavery, was an evangelical Anglican. And more recent men like W.H. Griffith Thomas, who was instrumental in forming Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, was a very godly evangelical Anglican. And we could go on more and more. There are a lot of them over the years. Until 1967, the evangelical wing considered themselves to be a remnant in an apostate church. So they believed that Anglican, Anglicanism as a whole was apostate, but within it, there was a remnant church that were true to the scriptures. However, um, in 1967, in Keele University in Nottingham in England, uh, men like John Stott, and J.I. Packer agreed to recognize all Anglicans, even if they believed in the Mass, even if they believed that there was no such thing as re resurrection, to recognize them as their brethren. Of course, that got Martin Lloyd-Jones really mad. <laughs> and uh, he broke fellowship with Packer and Stott over that decision in 67. And of course, it led the way for men like Packer to come out with this document, Evangelicals and Catholics together. Because once you recognize uh, Anglican Catholics, why not recognize Roman Catholics? Why not go the whole way? And so, again, just a warning, danger of compromise is a very dangerous thing. And certainly that's kind of the background of Anglicanism. But we're talking about the evangelical wing. And Daniel Wilson would have been absolutely livid at the thought of Evangelicals and Catholics together or even uh, recognizing uh, the liberal and Catholic wing as our fellow brethren. He was majorly opposed to those things, as we shall see. He, he was born in 1778, and he lived to 1858. Largely forgotten today, 
uh, but he was the fifth bishop of Calcutta in India. In fact, uh, in May of 2014, I had the privilege of visiting that Anglican cathedral and seeing the plaque there that it was erected through the uh, efforts of Daniel B. Wilson, because I just read that biography and I was kind of in interested in visiting that place. And I had the privilege of visiting it in Calcutta in 2014. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. That's a long way down the road in his life. But certainly he labored for 25 years uh, in uh, Calcutta, and uh, we'll talk more about that later. But um, one thing that he did say, and I like this, he, he said, the duty of duties for English Christians is to convert non-Christian residents of the Indian subcontinent from Hinduism, Islam, and Bud Buddhism to evangelicalism. So he, he was a man who was, his burden was to convert the entire Indian subcontinent to Christ. And so obviously a man who had vision and passion. But let's think about his conversion, first of all. Uh, he came from a godly home. Uh, in fact, the light of revival had shone for more than a generation in his family. His maternal grandfather had been a close friend of Whitfield and a trustee of Whitfield in his various efforts. And so obviously very close to George Whitfield. He had an uncle who sat regularly under the ministry of men like William Romain, Richard Cecil, Thomas Scott, Basil Wood, all evangelical men. He had a tutor uh, when he was a young boy, John Eyre, who was also a, a, a very uh, zealous evangelical. He was completely surrounded by gospel influence. But Wilson was far from God and deep in sin. In his own words, he says this, I love my sins and could not bear to part with them. That was his own confession. I love my sins and could not bear to part with them. He lived without prayer. He refused to read his Bible, even though he's surrounded by gospel influences. And uh, he loved to read, but not the Bible. He loved to read for recreation. Later on, he would say in manhood, he read for information. In old age, he read for relaxation. He was an avid reader. But at that point of his life, he had absolutely no time for the Bible. And he managed to take refuge in Calvinism's faulty logic. This is how he could live in sin, surrounded by evangelicals with a clear conscience, because in his mind, he said, if I'm one of the elect, God is going to save me, whether I like it or not. And so I'm not responsible. And so he was basically just waiting. If irre irresistible grace would do its work, so be it. If not, he would just enjoy his sin. And that was his philosophy. That's how he lived. It hushed his conscience. He, remind, he remained quiet and at ease, a willing slave of sin and Satan. Isn't that amazing? How these doctrines can have serious effects on people's thinking. In March 1796, a friend challenged him with the thought that God had not only chosen the end, but the means by which we could be saved. And it startled him. <laughs> and it started a deep struggle in his soul, a struggle that would last for 18 months until October the 1st, 1797, when he found rest for his troubled soul in the finished work of Christ. And when he got saved, he got well saved. I mean, he was a bright Christian. In fact, saved October 1st, October 4th, he wrote to his former tutor, John Eyre, a lifelong, become a lifelong friend. He said, I have felt a great desire to do anything to spread the name of Jesus, and that I have wished, if it were the Lord's will, to go as a missionary to he a heathen land. Now, he's only been saved three days, but he already wants to go to the mission field. Well, that wish would be fulfilled 35 years later when he would go as the fifth Anglican Bishop of Calcutta. Following this experience of awakening, he became part of what was known as the Clapham Sect, now, the Clapham sect was a group of evangelical Anglicans, uh, including Charles Simeon. He's one that we may do a, a talk on sometime. Henry Venn, 
William Wilberforce and others. They were very influential, uh, not just uh, in terms of church life, but politically influential, including the banning of slavery, the uh, Anthony Ashley Cooper, uh, getting rid of child labor laws, all kinds of things. It, you know, in fact, socialism did not really eliminate poverty. It was evangelical Anglicans in England that brought about humane laws in the workplace and all these other things. That's another story for another day. But his calling for the ministry, as you can see, pretty early on, he just had this incredible burden for ministry. But the problem was his father was a successful silk manufacturer and very wealthy, and he had plans for his son. But God had other plans. He felt a distinct call to go into the ministry, and his father forbade him. He waited patiently and prayed for a full year before his father eventually changed his mind. And he began training at Oxford, and uh, he, this is uh, his attitude as he goes to Oxford. He says, my soul yearns over the vast number of my poor fellow sinners who have never heard of Jesus and the life that is in him. And so greatly, greatly uh, affected by the need of souls. Oxford was in a terrible state when he went there, but he studied hard and was ordained September 20th, 1801. He preached his first sermon on John 6, 37. I'm going to read John 6, 37 because it would be very influential in his life. It says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And then this is the part I want you to notice. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Interestingly enough, many years later, his own prodigal son on his deathbed would be converted through John 6, 37. Wouldn't be uh, the uh, the joy of, uh, of Daniel Wilson, but it would be Daniel's other son, who was also an evangelical Anglican minister, who had the joy of pointing his wayward brother to Christ on his deathbed. And it was that scripture that he believed and died with great peace in his soul. So that's an encouragement for those of us that are praying for prodigals, that uh, uh, just to know that. Well, <clears throat> his first um, parish was in Chobham, in the south of England, and uh, he was so successful in his labors there that the university called him back and asked him to become the principal of Edmund Hall uh, in Oxford. He was a tireless student, even though he was a teacher in the school, but he read anything that would have a positive bearing on his ministry. I think that's a good principle there. Anything that he could get hold of that would have a positive bearing on his ministry, he would read avariciously. <laughs> he wanted to grow. He never, ever, and he continued that till the very end of his life, always desiring to grow in his usefulness for the Lord. He taught evangelical doctrine within Oxford University with forcefulness and clarity. And, and despite the success, he didn't enjoy the academic environment. He preferred to labor among souls. And after nine years, he once again uh, became a preacher of St. John's Chapel, Boreham Wood in London. That, since its inception, had been a bastion of evangelical Anglicanism. And it was there he would preach almost 1,200 sermons to eager hearers from the city of London. Lawyers, successful businessmen, the upper classes, they would come in their droves to hear this man preach with such zeal and passion and simplicity. And so he was tireless in every way in promoting the evangelical cause. He trained and prepared young men for the ministry. He encouraged his fellow evangelicals. He wrote literature and tracts. He did everything within his power to forward the cause of Christ and the gospel in the United Kingdom in those years. In the summer months, he would travel throughout the British Isles promoting the Church Missionary Society and the Bible Society, which he was a committee member of both. And so... As a result of all this labor, by 1822, his health broke. And he had to go kind of out of the picture for two years till 1824, uh, spending the time on the continent, just trying to recover his health. And when he came back, he was called to Islington. 
in London, uh, kind of a it's area in London, a very working class area. And in that area, there was one church and one chapel of ease, whatever that is, <laughs> serving 30,000 inhabitants. And so he threw himself into the work. Despite opposition, those uh, seat holders, remember in those days, people would pay for their seat uh, in churches and they would kind of rent a pew and that would be their pew. Well, they didn't want an evangelical preacher in the Islington church. And so he had a lot of opposition, but uh, he persisted on, managed to start 15 local Sunday schools in different areas uh, of Islington. Uh, he, by March 1827, the church was not only full, but 400 people had to be turned away every service. And he realized there's a significant need here. And so he managed, by the grace of God, to plant three more churches in Islington, see good evangelical men uh, in positions of leadership there. And Islington went from darkness to light, from being, as you would picture, Dickensian England, you know, the Charles Dickens England, dark and, and all the rest of it, to be a bastion of evangelicalism. Amazing transformation uh, through this man's tireless labors. He also... Um, was a lifetime friend of Charles Simeon, who was the founder of the Church Missionary Society, a man who had influenced men like Henry Martin, uh, the guy who said, let me burn out for thee, dear Lord, to go to India, and many others, including Reginald Heber, who wrote Holy, Holy, Holy. He was a predecessor of Wilson as Bishop of Calcutta. And uh, so he had gone again at the encouragement of Charles Simeon. And uh, the tragedy was the Bishop of Calcutta, well, it was a dangerous business uh, because uh, four previous bishops died in nine years because of the, the hard conditions uh, living in the tropics, tropical diseases, malaria, all of these things. And so four Anglican bishops died in nine years, and now there's a vacancy. And it was really hard to persuade anybody to go. <laughs> As you can understand, this is not exactly the primary bishopric available because uh, your chances of survival obviously are not very great if the previous four have died in nine years. And so uh, he he was determined that they, you have to have an evangelical. We can't have a Catholic guy. We can't have one of these liberal guys. We have to have an evangelical. He tried to persuade young, fire evangelical men to take this up. Nobody would go. And so at 54 years of age, he said, here am I, send me. And he went. And the Lord granted him 25 years of labor, of tireless labor in the tropics because the the bishopric of Calcutta included the whole of India, Burma, Malaya, or Malaysia now, Singapore. <laughs> and so it was huge. And in carrying out his mission, encouraging the laborers in the gospel in all these various countries, all these various places, he, he traveled thousands of miles. He was responsible, as we've said, building this cathedral in Calcutta. And again, you got to think of it. This was the first cathedral built in a pagan culture for centuries. This was a big deal. And it's a beautiful building, all the rest of it. And again, I'm not endorsing cathedrals and all the rest of it. I'm just telling his story and, and I want to learn some lessons from it. So as a result of all this, um, the Lord used him greatly, but he was a man who was constantly involved in conflict especially with a movement within Anglicanism called the Tractarian Movement. There were men like John Keble, uh, Pusey, E.B. E. Pusey, um, uh, Cardinal Newman, Henry Newman, who began to say that if we really want unity, we have to go back to the Catholic Church. And, of course, this horrified Daniel Wilson. And so he wrote vehemently against this movement. 
uh, he uh, was asked to speak that was within the Church of England. They had two separate missionary societies, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, which was high church traditionally and more liberal and Catholic. And then the Church Missionary Society, was, which was evangelical. He, on one trip back to the UK, was invited to speak at the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. And he blasted them for their liberalism and their false gospel. And there was absolute stony silence after he spoke <laughs> because he was fearless and he stood for the truth. And so um, what are some of the lessons we can learn from a man like Daniel Wilson? I want to give you some of the lessons that I found interesting. And by the way, uh, the, the information for this comes from uh, this particular book, Oxford and the Evangelical Succession by Sir Marcus Lowe. And it talks about men like Whitfield, Newton, Thomas Scott, Richard Cecil, Daniel Wilson, who were all of that ilk. And this one, Cambridge and the Evangelical Succession, again written by Sir Marcus Lowe, William Grimshaw, John Berridge, Henry Vell, then Charles Simeon. But anyway, uh, this man, uh, he, he was very disciplined, having, first of all, not wanted to read the Bible after his conversion, he read the Bible every year, along with Thomas Scott's commentary. Now, this is this is volume two of Thomas Scott's commentary, which is uh, from Ruth to Esther. <laughs> and so you can imagine uh, that uh, this, is, this is quite a tome. And he read through this, along with his Bible, every year, his entire life. <laughs> so a disciplined, disciplined man. He was tireless and uncompromising in his labors. He loved the gospel and did everything he could to promote it. At age 54, he was still willing to go to a new mission field for the cause of Christ. One where early death seemed more likely than anything else. And yet he said, here am I, send me. He had a strong and burning desire to finish well for the master. And it gripped him every single day. Lord, I wanted, and in fact, he wanted to die in the land of his adoption. And the Lord granted him that request. He died, as it were, with his boots on in India. He trained others. He encouraged others. He fought not only against the liberalism and the Catholicism in Anglicanism, but he also fought against the caste system in India, which had crept into the churches. And he vehemently withstood the caste system. And uh, again, believing that within the church, there's no male, female, Jew, Gentile, uh, uh, slave or free, we're all one in Christ. And so despite lots of opposition, lots of difficulty, he managed to by the grace of God, eradicate the thinking of the caste system within Christianity in India, which was a major, major thing. He overcame family tragedies. Uh, he had married his cousin Anne, which was, I guess, common in those days in 1803. They had six children together. Three of them died in infancy. The remaining three, one replaced him at Islington, as the evangelical man on the scene in that very vibrant area. And he was very thankful for that son who labored in his place. One was prodigal, but was saved, as we read, on his deathbed in uh, reading John 6, 37. And then he had one daughter that accompanied him to India. And then uh, just another couple of things. He was a founder in England, and we knew about this when we were newly saved, of the Lord's Day Observation Society. And uh, he could see the writing on the wall, even in his day, that Sunday was no longer special. And so he fought vehemently to keep Sunday special and uh, as a separate day, the Lord's Day Observation Society. So what we can see is that he was a very tireless labor, laborer for the Lord Jesus and saw many people come to saving faith in Christ in the working class districts of London to the streets of Calcutta. God used this man greatly. And again, there are many lessons we can learn from a man like that. We thank the Lord. We, we may not agree with their church polity, 
but we love their evangelical fervor and we thank God for them, for those things. Amen.